I want you to imagine that you just woke up in your car at the side of the road. You don't remember falling asleep, and you certainly do not remember driving. All you did was take a drug, one of the most common sleep medications in the entire country, exactly as it was prescribed to you. This was happening to women all across the United States, not because they were being careless, but because they were unknowingly overdosing. The drug, Ambien, metabolized in their bodies slower than it did in men. So it stayed in women's bodies longer than it did in men. But the clinical trials did not highlight this. And instead, women were waking up groggy, they were sleepwalking, and they were sleep driving with very little recollection of it in the next morning. It was not until 2013, more than 20 years after its initial approval, did the FDA recommend cutting the dose of Ambien in half for women. Now this is the cost of exclusion. When we do not study sex differences in medicine, people will get hurt. Back in high school, I was required to do a senior internship. Pretty standard for an overachieving Northeast high school. And I really wanted to work in pharmaceuticals. So I started working at a company to report clinical trial data to the FDA. In every single file that I had to review, I saw the same exclusion criteria. Pregnant and lactating women are excluded from this study. Every file, every report. These were trials that millions would rely upon, and yet people like my mother at one point, or future me, would not even be a part of the equation. This word excluded really stuck with me, and I couldn't help but wonder, has this always been the case? Actually, yes. Thalidomide was a drug given in the 1950s to treat morning sickness. It was distributed widely, yet never actually tested on pregnant women, despite them being the largest consumer base. The result? Tens of thousands of babies being born with severe deformities and nearly half dying within months. Some call it the biggest man-made medical disaster in history. This revealed severe systemic blind spots, and policy had only recently begun to address them. In 1993, the NIH Revitalization Act mandated that women and minorities be included in all preclinical and clinical studies. This was the first federal law to directly address the imbalance in diversity in medical research participation. Yet inclusion did not necessarily mean analysis. And for years, male and female data was being collected, but they were treated as interchangeable. And we saw those consequences with Ambien. Imagine how many other drugs flew under the radar. So that's why in 2015, the NIH introduced sex as a biological variable, which required researchers to consider sex in both animal and human studies. The goal was simple. Sex matters, so we must study it. But since 2015, the implementation has not entirely been even, as some studies may still default to male bias cell lines or male animals due to concerns about variability or convenience. When I got to MIT, I knew that this is exactly what I wanted to tackle. But first, I want to demystify what women's health means to me. I like to think about it in three main categories. The first being conditions unique to women, like pregnancy and menstruation. The second being conditions that disproportionately impact women, like breast cancer and autoimmune disease. And the last being conditions that present differently in males and females, such as heart disease. And at MIT, I've been able to research all three. With the Conformable Decoders Group at the MIT Media Lab, I was involved in building a wearable breast ultrasound device that can be embedded within a bra for operator-independent and at-home scanning of breast cancer. The goal of this project was to catch breast cancer in the 30% of cases that occur in interval periods, so that is in between mammogram appointments. I've spoken to hundreds of women who've received mammograms, and the main concern in all of those studies is basically how uncomfortable and how awkward the entire process is. The goal was very simple, and it was to put the power of ultrasound into the hands of women. I've also been involved in understanding the sex-specific differences in Alzheimer's disease with my mentor, Professor Manolis Kellis. Alzheimer's disease occurs almost twice as much in women than it does in men, 
and I've been involved in understanding the gene expression markers and the metabolites that make up this difference so that we can one day build personalized therapeutics to directly address each patient need and not just the average. Through all of these experiences, I've used some pretty heavy computing tools, and it's made it clear that we're at an inflection point with the integration of artificial intelligence in biological sciences. Some equate the use of AI in medicine as being able to do billions of years of a PhD in very short timescales. And this is absolutely extraordinary. I'm sure a billion years could definitely make up for the few century lag in women's health. However, we must also be very mindful of the past that has so long defined the way we conduct science. Because what we feed into these models truly matters. And if we feed them male biased or incomplete data, then we will simply replicate and accelerate the same blind spots that we've been living with for decades. It truly matters who is asking these questions and who is demanding the funding to get these questions answered. I know that I will one day need a mammogram, and I know that I am in the group that's at a higher risk for Alzheimer's disease. So when I do this work, I don't just do it as a researcher in a lab coat, I do it as a future patient. And this urgency is exactly what motivates me to drive this research forward. However, is this all just about women? Actually, no. Don't worry, men and everyone else. We haven't forgotten about you in the process. Take relaxin, for example. Relaxin is a hormone that's produced in the body during pregnancy to help prepare the body for childbirth. But here's the twist. Researchers have recently found that relaxin can actually be a potential treatment for fibrosis, which is a deadly disease caused by tissue scarring in the lung, liver, and even the heart. So a hormone made by pregnant women could one day save your brother's life, or your father's, or yours. It makes you think how many other answers we have not yet discovered simply because we were not looking in the right direction. We now have the framework and the tools to ask these questions and to get answers quickly. And this is not a distant future, it is actively in the works. I am involved in pioneering the Women's Health Innovation Fund, WHX, at the MIT Media Lab. Here, we hope to revolutionize women's health with the integration of biomedical research, wearable devices, and artificial intelligence. The future of medicine is precise, it is personalized, and it is predictive. And it is built on data that reflects the diversity of our real world. It is time to move beyond patchwork fixes and instead build systems that work for everybody. Because when we get it right for women, we benefit everybody. And we open new frontiers in science that we haven't even been able to imagine. Thank you.